Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. Please be seated. I don't know how the rest of you learned about Advent when you grew up in the church, but I'll tell you how I learned about Advent. It was called the Little Lent, and we wore purple, and we, uh, we were very sober and somber. We also had rules about what was allowed and what was not allowed. And Christmas trees, not allowed. Christmas decorations, no, no, no. We observe an, a holy advent. So that means we are supposed to deck our house with purple and beat our breasts a little bit, increase our prayer practice, so that when we get to Christmas, it'll be a big, wonderful surprise, kind of like Easter, right? Did anybody else grow up like that? Yeah, a few of us. <laughs> Well, it's this constant struggle between us and the culture. You notice that the Christmas tree across the street is lit. It lit up my whole apartment last night. And people are out buying their Christmas trees. And what do we do? Do we uh, do what we used to do? Or are we changing with the changing church? You know what I think, right? We need to change. And if you remember a sober and somber Advent, throw it away. <laughs> Because Advent, according to our scripture, is a time to be alert and wakeful, but also a time to yearn with joy as you would yearn, yearn for your lover to return. Or, for instance, one of our parishioners at the early service had a son recently returned, or a grandson, recently returned from Afghanistan. And she posted a picture of her joyful face embracing her grandson. That return of a loved one is how we're supposed to be waiting for Jesus. And scripture tells us today, this is from Mark, that none of us know when the hour comes. We don't know when the second coming is coming. So if anybody says that they do know, be cautious. Because not even Jesus knows. He says only the Father knows. And if you don't know someone is coming, it's likely to get really old and tiring to wait and wait and wait for them. Then you go through anger a little bit. Like, when is he coming? All right, forget it. I'm putting away all the decorations. He's never coming. And then you forget about God altogether. So that's what uh, Isaiah, our first reading, is all about. He's trying to wake people up. And he goes on for many, many chapters. Very large book in our Bible, Isaiah. Saying, wake up, wake up, wake up. And he also says that when God is not apparent, that we sin without God. If we can't see him, we start doing things that aren't God-centered. I'll say that. They're not God-centered. So we need him to come back to remind us to be good. But we're supposed to be attentive, lighting candles and making lights and singing hymns and being joyful that he's coming any minute. How do we keep up that kind of energy? Well, this reading we have today from Mark, you notice we haven't been reading from Mark. It's a new season, new part of the church year. This is the beginning of the church year, and we're going to be reading out of Mark this year. And those of you who have heard me preach know that I love Mark because he does little tricky things with his text to make us pay attention to what's important. There's the Mark sandwich, remember I've talked about this, where he'll put a set of verses at one end of the paragraph or several pages and at the end of the several pages he'll repeat that he'll have like a slice of bread a slice of bread and a sandwich in between so we're supposed to know that what's in the middle is important well today he has a way of saying a certain time of the day in fact it's the time of night that we're going to pay attention to and then he shows immediately after this what happens if you're not awake so we have a real life documentary here with a good storyteller telling us this is what happens if you're not awake. Mark was a campfire storyteller. He told his gospel in a breathless kind of way so that when you read Mark, you're supposed to read it from the very beginning to the very end, and you catch the breathlessness with which he tells it when you see all this, and then, and then, and then suddenly he, and immediately he, he's like, 
hurrying on to the next thing that Jesus did because it's all so marvelous in his eyes and he wants to tell you the whole story before you lose your attention and we have a commercial break. That's Mark. So, don't be surprised that he'll jump out and scare you sometimes, just like a good storyteller around the campfire. So what we need to pay attention to here is keeping awake. It's the very end of the reading. Therefore, says Jesus in Mark's story, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. We've established that. In the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn. You hear four times. Or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. That's very Mark. And what I say to you, I say to all. Stay awake. So what happens right after this is that Jesus enters his passion. And the first thing that happens is that he has his Passover dinner where he says goodbye to his beloved brothers and sisters. The text says it was in the evening when he has this meal. And he has his goodbye speech in this goodbye meal. So that's the evening. In Roman times, everybody was used to observing the four watches during the night, and these times that Mark talks about are observed by all of the Roman citizens, by having a guard watching. Somebody's always awake at evening, at midnight, at cock crow, and at dawn. So evening was the Passover meal. Midnight comes, and Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying. It's midnight. And he is very uh, energetic, our Lord Jesus Christ. And his disciples have all been at the Passover dinner, ate a full meal, drank lots of wine, and he says, stay awake. And what do they do? They fall asleep. And he goes and says his prayers, prostrates himself on the ground, comes back, finds him sleeping. Three times he goes away, says his prayers, and each prayer gets more heart-rending. He is going through the thought of the coming passion, like his heart is breaking in two. The one thing he asks his brothers to do, stay awake, and they're incapable of doing it. They're like drugged. They cannot stay awake. Three times he tries to say, please stay awake. You see, I'm dying here. Stay awake, and they fall asleep. The next thing we know, it's cock crow. When the cock Crows, the next watch, what happens? Peter denies Jesus three times. Three times he tries to wake him up. Three times the rooster crows. The sense of betrayal just tears Peter's heart in two. And then comes the morning. And what happens in the morning? He is handed over to Pilate for judgment, and from there he goes to be crucified. The four night watches, four times when something happens to betray. What happened at the Passover meal that was a betrayal? Judas. Judas. There was a betrayal at all four of these. Judas, and then falling asleep, handing him over for the, for the trial, and then the cock crows, Peter, hearing that he had denied his Lord three times. So this is... Mark's way of throwing attention on what it is we're supposed to be awake for. We're awake to be partners or brothers or sisters with Jesus Christ, just to be a partner with him. If Jesus is suffering and struggling alone, we need to be there befriending him. And where do we find Jesus to befriend him? We had this last week in our readings. We look for the neediest, the hungriest, the loneliest, the poor, we look, we look for the disadvantaged, and there we will find Jesus. And that's Mark's way of telling us how to stay awake for Advent. But he also includes what's happening at the end of time. You notice that's how he starts. That the darkness will go out of, I mean, that the darkness will cover the sky. There will be darkness, and the stars will fall, and the moon will drop out of the sky. There will be no sun. And that happens when Jesus is nailed to the cross. It is noon, the brightest part of the day, and the darkness covers the earth for three hours in Mark's gospel. It is dark. So there it is, it's the apocalypse. 
And when he breathes his last breath, when he dies, the curtain of the temple is torn in two. The heavens are rent apart, and Jesus ascends, only to say, watch out, because I'm coming down again. So we can take a page out of our evangelical brothers and sisters and be paying attention in a way that makes us sing every day and talk about it to everybody. If you're comfortable, I say go for it. But how else can we stay awake? One of the things I like to do, because my spiritual director asks me this every month, he says, how's your prayer life, Magdalene? And I will report on my prayer life. So since Advent is only four weeks, I like to invite a new prayer practice of some sort into my life. And when you do a prayer practice, make sure it's something you really like to do and that you will be committed to. So I read the Bible, as you might guess, a lot, but I don't read it every day. So my prayer practice this Advent is to read a little scripture every day. I get up in the morning, say my prayers anyway, I'll just make sure that I open my Bible. And that's something I like to do, so I will do it. Don't punish yourself with anything you don't like to do. Do something that you love, because you remember you're waiting for your beloved, who could come at any time. And the best way we can be awake is to pray. Say your prayers and make those prayers a part of your getting ready for Christmas. So I am getting the lights out and I'm setting up my numerous nativity sets because I have a thing about nativity sets. So you see a nativity set in all my rooms. And I'm getting out my Christmas tree and I'm getting ready for Christmas. Because Advent is not about beating our breasts and feeling lowly and poor and calling it a moon land. It is not a moon land. It is a joyful time to wait for your love to come through the door and embrace you with kisses and hugs. <laughs>